Experience the thrill of the race with Scalextric, proud sponsors of the Motorsport Podcast. Throughout the history of motor racing, the drivers have always been the big stars, always in the headlines. But their performance does depend on some brilliant engineers. This Motorsport Podcast series is going to explore what it takes to handle the greatest drivers in the sport by talking to some of the greatest engineers. These podcasts are brought to you in association with Scalextric. And today we're joined by Steve Hallam, who has had an amazing career. I'll just briefly give you some highlights of it. Um, he started with Aston Martin, not on the racing team, clearly. Uh, went to Lotus, where he worked with Mansell and Senna. Went to McLaren, where he worked with Alonso, Hakkinen, you name it, he worked with them. And then a big change, moving to NASCAR with Daryl Waltrip, and then on to V8 Supercars, and now with Toyota Racing Development, and he's talking to us today from California. Welcome, Steve. Ah, thank you, Rob. Thank you. It's lovely to see you and talk, to be able to talk to you again. Yes, I agree. Yes, it's been a long time. And I'm actually going to ask you a question about McLaren at the Festival of Speed a bit later on. But let's start at the beginning. Can you tell us why you went into engineering? Because when you were a youngster, you actually raced a clubman's car, didn't you? I did. I had a couple of Clubman's cars. They were both uh, Centaurs, originally built by Richard Scott in uh, uh, Suffolk, I think, uh, was where he worked out of. And uh, myself and a close friend, we, we shared the car and we um, raced, had some very en enjoyable races <laughs> in Clubman's Formula, which is a great, I'm not sure what it's like now, but at that time was a fascinating formula for engineers. No weight limit. Uh, you could be as innovative as you like, as long as the center line of the rearmost spark plug in the engine it was 36 inches forwards of the rear rear axle center line. So uh, a lot of people bought Malloc's and they were very successful. Uh, and there were some very ingenious people who created some fascinating cars to race in that formula. And it was a great fundamental grounding for, for going racing. Your slick tires, whatever aero you could put on. We, we were arguably just pre-ground effect. If Formula One is the time metric, it was a lot of fun. I love the spark plug rule. Brilliant. Was your ambition always to be an engineer rather than a racing driver. I mean, that, that would, and the Clubman's was part of the fascination for you. Yes. I mean, it, it dates back to school, really. Making your A level choices back in the uh, 60s, probably late 60s, I opted for the um, maths, physics, chemistry route. Uh, my university application, Loughborough University of Technology, at the top of the list, simply because that was of the 66 listed universities at the time, they offered an automotive engineering course, four-year thin sandwich course, which uh, spat you out and spat me out at the end of four years uh, with a uh, Bachelor of Technology in uh, Automotive Engineering. I was fortunate enough as part of my the sandwich uh, uh, aspect of the course to um, do my industrial training uh, with Aston Martin. Uh, when I graduated, which was in June of 1975, they had literally, I think, uh, and I can't remember how many times this happened over the history of Aston Martin, they went into liquidation. But the reformed company did offer me a job uh, in the engineering department or experimental department, as they called it then. And I was employed as a development engineer. Uh, if you looked around the engineering department, there was the chief development engineer and me. And <laughs> it was a very small company then. And we were, we got on with it. And I was taught very well by David Morgan, who was the chief development engineer. He ensured that I was exposed to, and there was no choice in this, let's put it that way, to all aspects of vehicle engineering as we 
strove to produce the uh, V8 uh, model. We were uh, also, the design office was working on the Lagonda, the four-door digital instrumentation Lagonda. Uh, and then we, we also produced the Vantage version of the um, V8. And it was, that was, I have to say, that was a thrilling time because you probably didn't realize it at the time um, because you, there was no time to reflect but you were covering um, many, many aspects of vehicle engineering, eight o'clock till six o'clock every day. It was wonderful. This was a tremendous grounding for a young man, wasn't it? I mean, because, simply because there were so few of you. Therefore, I'm imagining that you got to do an incredible variety of different challenges. Uh, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I can remember, well, a couple of stories. I, I was out testing uh, an Aston, and it ended up being late one night, and I, I must have been 23 years old, and I was driving back to Newport Pagnell, and I got stopped by a policeman, and I was actually stationary at a traffic light, so I wasn't doing anything silly, and he pulled me over, and he swaggered up to the car, and he looked at me, and looked at the car, and he said, is this your car, sir? <laughs> uh, and I said, no, it's not, and he, he almost rubbed his hands as if he was going to nail me. Anyway, the story came out and he let me on my way. I was in in, in Dunstable, uh, the set of traffic lights in Dunstable, not far from uh, from Newport Pagnell. And uh, uh, an another instance was um, we were working on the development of Lagonda. We'd be into 1977 by then. We were struggling with the instrumentation. I got a call from our um, general manager, his name was Steve Coughlin, and he said, um, paraphrasing, I need you to go to Dallas. Uh, and I said, Dallas? He said, yes, in the USA. Okay. He said, we found a company over there that, that can um, deliver us uh, uh, an instrumentation panel, and we, we need to get out there and work with them and, and make sure it happens. And, and so off I went, and at the same time, I also got involved in the uh, design of the air conditioning system for the same car, which was also done in Dallas, but by a different company. So uh, there were all manner of things that were dropped on your lap. I, I like to think of myself as a generalist, let's put it that way, rather than a specialist. Let's move forward a bit. You went to Lotus. Um, how did it come about that you were recruited by Colin Chapman. So the Institute of Mechanical Engineers used to, in those days, have a um, fortnightly newspaper, which I think was called uh, Mechanical Engineering News. In 1981, and I, I had just finished the Bulldog project for Aston Martin, I was looking at this and there was a very cryptically worded, uh, in the appointment section, a very cryptically worded uh, advert, which there was this organization was looking for vehicle dynamics engineers. There was no name. It was just a box number and what have you. And it, it implied it was for Formula One. And myself, along with, I am sure, thousands of others applied, heard nothing for months. And I, I'd send my CV in. And then suddenly, I, I actually got a phone call from a gentleman, David Phipps. And David was a photographer. You probably knew him, Rob. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he died a while ago now. And I, I knew, I knew immediately who he was. Because, you know, if you read any book about the early days of Lotus, you'll read about David Phipps. David, uh, said, I can't tell you who I'm representing, but I'd like to meet you. And we met at a pub in Newmarket. And I thought this is a bit of a giveaway. This is Lotus for sure. And I, I went and I had lunch with him. Very nice man. And I got to know him uh, subsequently. Uh, we spoke for a couple of hours over lunch. He said, I can't tell you who I'm representing. He kept repeating this. That was it. And it would just went quiet again. Uh, and then, and I thought, oh, well, it was worth a try. And then the, the phone rang again and it was David. And he was saying, um, uh, I'd like you to come to Ketchingham Hall. He then said, yeah, and you probably know why. And I, I was due to meet um, Colin Chapman and went off to Ketteringham Hall, and I didn't meet Colin Chapman. I met Peter War. Peter uh, told me that the old man had had to go or do something. 
And Peter interviewed me. I didn't know it at the time, but a couple of weeks later, I got a, a letter saying, you know, this is the offer, this is the opportunity. And it was like, it's Christmas. And on February the 15th of 1982, uh, I joined Team Lotus and I was thrilled. And there were 60 people at Team Lotus and I was to be uh, Mansell's race engineer and a guy from the drawing office, uh, Tim Densham, who went on to be uh, chief designer at uh, Renault uh, in much later years. He was Elio's, was to become Elio's race engineer. And Peter had explained that they were looking to uh, move the engineering uh, resource or spread the engineering resource further into trackside operations and um, designate a, a, a specific engineer for each of the two drivers. They would not be designing during the week and then rushing off to the race. Their, their focus would be totally to immerse themselves in optimising the performance of the car at the track. And off we went. And my first race was Rio in Brazil. Uh, 1982. And we were still in ground effect um, specification at that time with flexible fixed skirts. That race was the water cool brakes saga. We built quite a lightweight Formula One car and it was ballasted up to weight with water, ostensibly to cool the brakes. In principle, um, I think the bottom line is you were allowed to replenish fluids at the end of the race that you had consumed it wasn't gasoline or petrol that was how you and so we had this water tank on the car and the deal was once the race started uh the driver would basically release the water and race the car at a, at a l lower than arguably legal weight although it was all legal at the time and then you'd come back in and post-race scrutiny and you'd be allowed to fill the water tank back up and you were hopefully uh, the right side of the weight limit. Uh, that, that's essentially what it was. Yeah, it, it even evolved in in later years. And I think Martin Brundle fell foul of a regular, uh, similar regulation. Yeah, it was a little bit weird. The Formula One rule book at the time, and somewhat somewhere in my files, I, I'm pretty confident I've got a copy. It was 32 pages long, yeah. single-sided A4, a and that was it. Uh, in my later years, I got involved in, uh, I call them the clever fuels that we used to use in Formula One. There was a single paragraph on the fuel regulation in those uh, 1982 regulation set. And that, now I think the fuel regulation is probably as long as the the original set of uh, Formula One regulations. That's progress for you. You know, with all the shenanigans that went on at that particular race we ended up third although we didn't we didn't experience the podium with Nigel because it was as a result of subsequent disqualifications it was a great start but boy motor racing in those days is and particularly Formula One and some of the tracks you would go to uh, Rio being one of them Dijon springs to mind the facilities there were primitive shall we say tell me about working with Nigel Mansell because from memory, I don't think Peter Waugh was entirely convinced by Nigel Mansell, although Chapman was, wasn't he? Was he very receptive to engineering input? Was he that kind of driver? N Nigel was one of those breed of drivers. And, and, and in many respects, Rob, all of the drivers in that era were physically strong and tough characters. The cars were brutes to drive. Aero loading on the car and the absence of power steering, the cars were very unsophisticated. And Nigel was immensely strong. And I, I, I think he really blossomed when he left us and went to Williams. But there was no doubt uh, the old man recognised in Nigel this innate talent and loyalty, total devotion in the cockpit to his duty. Nigel was of that ilk of driver, uh, and I've never forgotten this, who would strap the car to his back and run with it if necessary to, to, to finish the race. Sure, there were other aspects to Nigel, but fundamentally 
if you were in a fight, you wanted Nigel on your side. He was remarkable in the car. And from an engineer's perspective, it was very simple. If the change that you made, if he was able to drive the car faster with the change that you made, then you knew, and it was a very crude yardstick, that you'd made the car better. I don't know how the drivers felt the subtleties of some of the changes that we were perhaps asking them to feel because they were so st stiffly sprung and they were lit the cars were leaping about all over the time and you know in, in in the quicker corners the driver would essentially set the trajectory of the car using the steering wheel and he wouldn't be able to adjust that tra trajectory once he committed to the corner for example when you raced at ricard which had the old mistral straight and that blindingly fast right hand scene at the end of it mm. uh, on, honestly i don't know how those guys dealt with that because i mean it was flat and you just after like 1.7 kilometers or however long that straight was you that car was going as fast as it would go and you turned right and didn't lift <laughs> and and you knew that you couldn't really correct uh, the car if it, if it, if it veered offline or, or or started to over rotate or whatever so yeah they were mighty i think possibly a lack of imagination helped <laughs> What about Ayrton Senna? I mean, okay, obviously there's been a lot of a lot written about Senna and a lot spoken about Senna, and his record speaks for itself. But I, I imagine you tell me, but he, he was a very different character indeed, wasn't he? Uh, he was more cerebral. Would that be fair? Very much so. Um, so Ayrton joined us in for the 1985 season and raced with us through 85, 86, and 87, so for three years. We had moved on from the um, ground effect cars. Uh, we had, this is at Lotus, we transitioned to um, Renault Turbo Power. In June of, uh, obviously the old man died at the end of 1982, which was tragic and worrying for all of us um, because we really didn't know what was going to happen at that time or beyond. To his eternal credit, uh, Peter uh, and the family pressed on. And uh, I know that companies like Renault, who we'd signed for to use their engines for 83, that there was a way out of the contract if they wanted to take it. And they didn't. Uh, they stayed with us, which was a huge relief on our side, but it showed the the nature of the company that we were dealing with. Uh, midway through 1983, uh, Gerard Ducarouge joined us as um, a technical director. Well, he arrived with his briefcase, and when he opened his briefcase, we we're all thinking, oh, my God, you know, we're going to get the plans to this, that, and the other. And all that was inside it was a, a 200 pack of Marlboro red cigarettes. <laughs> and he proceeded to smoke like a chimney for the, for the whole time he was there. But he introduced us. Uh, and we were hungry to learn to a different way of going motor racing and engineering cars and designing cars. By the time uh, Ayrton joined us, we were in a situation where we had a fundamentally better product than we had when I, I started with uh, Nigel and Elio driving. We had in Ayrton a driver of who was very young. He'd had one year of Formula One experience with Tolman, but his speed and sensitivity and desire to learn, he was a very open character. He loved testing. He would drive and drive and drive. And he, he, he did say at one stage, a journalist had asked him, how he would like to spend his favorite day. And he, he said, at Silverstone with, with the boys and a great car and just driving and developing the car and making it go faster and faster and faster. I know these are feel like schoolboy words, but that's, that's what it was like with him. There was never an issue to drive. He loved driving. He loved learning about the car. He, he loved just making it faster. He was an incredibly sensitive individual. And I think so, some drivers have to be taught. And some drivers, 
intuitively know and, and have an understanding about the car and how to make the tires last and how to manage the car through a race. And he brought that with him. If you asked him, where did you learn that or who taught you? He wouldn't necessarily know, have known the answer, but he knew, he knew how to look after the tires. He knew how to nurse the car. And a, a, a couple of stories to that effect. We were, we were testing at Ricard once and he, he, he came into, we were on the full circuit and he, he came into the pits and said, oh, there's a vibration at the back of the car. Bob Dance, chief mechanic, did his normal inspection. I watched Bob do this many, many times. Uh, looking at the car, first of all, he checks each, each suspension bolt around the back of the car and everything's intact. Okay, so there's nothing loose. Or he, he then, um, he actually called it his arsehole light, but it was a, like a, there, there weren't LED lights in those days, but it was a tiny little light that he would shine into the inspection port on the top of the gearbox to look at the Bramwell and pinion. And he rotated the rear wheel to so he could see every tooth. And he found a tooth off the pinion. And in, in those days, we had so much talk with the um, uh, Renault engine that the gearbox life was literally the limiting factor on um, Formula One cars in those days. The tooth had come off, and so uh, we were down whilst we changed the gearbox and what have you. I sort of explained to Ayrton that we'd, we'd be down for a while whilst we fixed this, and he said, ah, mm, tooth off the opinion. Right, I'll remember that. I'll know next time, and I'll be able to help you get there quicker if this ever happens again. We, we moved on, and we were... In Detroit, we were on the streets and we were literally back on the streets of Detroit. We got to the grid and this was 86. So we, we won the 86 Detroit Grand Prix and we're on the grid. Nigel Stepney um, was the number one mechanic and he, he got the car jacked up and he was underneath the car and he was waving to me and I sort of went to him. And he handed me, I couldn't see what it was because he had it the way he was holding it in his hand, handed me something and I picked it up from him and it was rigging hot. And it was a skid block from the bottom of the gearbox. And I, I can't say what I said at the time. And I thought, oh my God, what are we going to do? And I said to Nigel, can you get another one in the gearbox, he said, no, it's just ripped out the gearbox. The magnesium is bent out of it. I'm thinking, oh, what are we going to do here? And uh, we had a quick conflab and we decided not to tell Ayrton because we were a serious contender for this race. All through that race, I was thinking, I hope the floor lasts. I hope this lasts because it was a very rough circuit in those days. It still is. And uh, we won the race and afterwards... I, sa I said to Ayrton, I have something to tell you. And he said, what was that? And I said, well, you know, you, on your running lap to the grid, you pulled off the, um, we lost the gearbox skid. And he said, oh, that's interesting. I thought, I didn't feel the bottoming at the car uh, initially uh, as much as I thought it was going to do. He said, no, that explains it. And I said, I, I just didn't want to tell you because I didn't want you thinking that you were not going to finish, you know, what have you. He said, don't worry. He said, Anything like that, just let me know and I'll drive around it. I'll accommodate it. You can read stories about how Jim Clark used to nurse cars. I'm not saying we ever asked Ayrton to nurse a car, but he could spread the load around the car. If you said, Ayrton, we're a bit marginal on brakes here, I'll take care of it. And he'd use the gearbox a bit more or he'd use the engine braking to take some load off the brakes or he was capable of spreading the usage of the car, distributing the usage of the car uh, to manage it. And it was not a problem. Some drivers would, the world would end if you told them something like that and asked them to do something, you know, um, like that, but not with him, not with him. He was, he was remarkable in many respects, and that was one of them. It was a real privilege to work for that guy, wasn't it? I can't tell you what, you know, the experience of working with him. And whilst I, I, I ran him for three years at Lotus, 
And whilst I didn't run him uh, directly at McLaren, and because he, when I joined McLaren, he was uh, in '91. He was, you know, he was there, and I engineered uh, Gerhard for two years, '91 uh, and '92, and then Michael for '93 for those three years that uh, Ed was also there of overlap. The harmony in the, um, and I missed the Pross era. The harmony in the engineering uh, debriefs and what have you, it, it was a total team in that respect. And um, uh, obviously, the world knows that um, Ayrton and Gerhard got on very well together, and they did. To, to watch Ayrton help Michael in, in, in 93 just reinforced the fact that uh, he was a, a caring person, and he... He was, he was so, this is not the right way to say it, he was very confident in his own ability and it was not a problem for him to share that. Whereas some drivers would be a little bit more measured or controlled perhaps, it wasn't a problem for him. That's very interesting because at the time I don't think it was common knowledge that uh, Senna was trying to help Michael Andretti. Oh, very much so. Very much so. And I think Michael really appreciated that. Steve, before we move on to McLaren, as I said at the beginning, this podcast is supported by Scalextric. And I'm wondering, in your childhood, did you have a Scalextric? Did you, uh, did you go racing? I most certainly did. Oh. <laughs> I had, in my youth, my misspent youth, arguably, was my brother and I had, it was called Champion. It was a 143rd uh, scale as opposed to 132nd, which was uh, scale extra and airfix. We accrued over the years a huge track that we would have set up. And I, I had got a um, uh, airfix, did some beautiful 132nd cars. And I, I bought the 1965 BRM, which was a beautiful looking car. What was it? The 256. It was a lovely car. And I, I fitted a uh, rear wing to it, uh, which when, when, you, when the car lifted off, it tipped forwards. And when it accelerated, it rocked backwards. And you know, it used to devour the, the slot racing mags. Um, for all sorts of trick to, to, tricks to find. You needed to get the rear end to stick basically had years of fun with those cars. And then you were building, you know, little brass tube chassis and you'd buy a, a clear plastic molding of a chaparral or, or what have you, and you'd pin, pin the body to the side of the chassis. Oh, it was lovely. It was great stuff. This podcast is supported by Scalextric. Listeners can claim 10% off all Scalextric products by visiting www scalextric.com and using the code RACE10 that's R-A-C-E in capital letters followed by figure 10, RACE10 at checkout this offer is valid until the 30th of September this year and cannot be used in conjunction with any other offer a full list of terms and conditions is available on the Scalextric website McLaren. Well, we can't. We can't. You were th you were there for nearly twenty years. We can't possibly cover the whole of it. But one thing that really intrigued me at the time was Hakkinen's not only his speed, but his sort of phlegmatic character. And in in many ways, I, I thought he was as fast as, if not faster, than Michael Schumacher. So tell me about Mika. Mika was fast immediately. Uh, our experience of, uh, interesting, I, I met, met Mika, uh, and it was really only in passing. As I was essentially leaving Team Lotus, Mika would join Team Lotus as a, a driver for the 91 season. So I, I met him the back end of 1990, I think it was, and um, didn't think too much of it. It was a, he didn't, he was quite shy. Uh, didn't talk a lot. I had seen him race at Snetterton uh, in Formula 3, and I saw the the famous inversion at the bomb hole, and um, I was there for that that particular uh, event. Yeah. The guy was very cl clearly very quick, but that was it. Anyway, join, join McLaren. By 
the end of 92, Ron obviously uh, was concerned about the driver lineup for 93. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he retained Mika. However it panned out, Mika ended up being the test driver for the majority of the year at um, McLaren. And uh, in the regulations in those days were uh, Silverstone was the nominated test track, mid in season test track. So we we ran and ran and ran at Silverstone a lot. And we were obviously developing the active car that year as well. And Pat Fry was the engineer on the test team and he did a lot of the spade work behind the scenes on the um, on the active car with Mika at Silverstone. During the course of that year, there was no doubt that Mika was very quick. And then when, for want of a better word, push came to shove, following the Italian race at Monza in 93, uh, Michael got himself on the podium and it was a great drive by Michael. Um, there was a lot of passion and emotion in that drive that put him on the podium. But that turned out to be his last drive for McLaren. And we went to Estoril. It was a completely you know, regular weekend for us, apart from the fact that um, Mika was driving instead of Michael. By the time we had got to the end of first practice on Friday morning, Ron was beaming from ear to ear. And he was going, we've got a quick one here. We've got a quick one here. And um, Mika was very quick. A driver, a quick driver, couldn't want for a better reference than Ayrton. If you were close to what he was doing, you knew you were in, in the ballpark. And, and Mika was more than close. He was quick. But Ayrton, as I was mentioning earlier, some of Ayrton's attributes and skills, you didn't need to teach Ayrton because he he was aware of what he needed to do in the cockpit of the car. Ultimately, at the end of qualifying, Friday qualifying, Mika hipped Ayrton. And come come Saturday in the race, you saw there was a, a separation, particularly in the race. It was clear that, yes, we did have a quick one in Mika. Uh, there was still a bit that he he, he needed to learn. But he, he had the fundamental thing that you cannot teach, which was the speed. He, he was quick. And we went into 94 with the Peugeot car. And that was a bit of a struggle, 94. Although we did, we did score a reasonable points. So and Martin Brandle joined us for 94 and ran alongside Mika. Uh, 95, uh, we switched to Mercedes. Uh, and so there was a lot going on. If you take the racing side out of it, there was a, a huge amount of work going on back at the factory, so to speak, uh, with these engine changes. And Mika had his accident at the end of 95 in Adelaide. It was a serious accident, as everybody knows. We didn't know whether he would recover in time for the next year. We didn't know whether he'd want to drive. We didn't know... There were many, many unanswered questions. And um, Ron asked me to take a car down to Ricard uh, for Mika in February of 96. Uh, and Tyler Alexander came with me. And um, he said, I'm not coming. Ron said, I'm not coming. I just want this, the minimum crew possible. And I just want you to give Mika the chance to drive. No pressure. And let, let's see if he wants to drive. Uh, and then we can start to make some decisions for what was going to happen in, in 96. So we, we were down there. Ferrari were testing the day before. And Michael was driving. And um, obviously, you don't know what they were up to, but we had the stopwatches out and we, we worked out what a good, a good lap time was the day before. Uh, and Ferrari packed up and left. And there was only us there the next day. Uh, Mika arrived in a, a SL Mercedes. We hadn't seen him since he got in the car to go out for practice at... Um, at uh, Adelaide, said to Mika, so this is what we're here to do. We've just got this many tyres. We've got plenty of fuel. Let's just go and drive and see, see how you feel. 
So we were on the Grand Prix circuit, the short Grand Prix circuit. Let's, he said, let's take the car around. And he put the roof down. I was in the passenger seat. We went off. And, he, and I was sort of looking at him, thinking, well, he, he looks all right. He's talking all right. Um, everything seems all right. And we would, you know, that I think the French call it the fifth half, the fifth path or whatever. The, that sort of you come around the scene, you do Le Bose, and then you do that little kink. Uh, on your way back to the pit straight. And we we took the curbs through there and the old um, Mercedes roll hoop pings up, you know, because it had had one of those sort of uh, yeah. crash activated roll hoops or, on it. Uh, and I said, well, he's, he's, you know, he's giving it a bit of a go. So I said, I think it's about time we go on the real car. And so he did, and he ran all day. We really ran to his agenda, although we were just trying to manage it a, li a little bit. And he ended up going faster than Michael had done the previous day. Uh, and Ron called me at the end of the day and said, you know, how'd it go? What what do you think? And said, well, he's not short of speed. He has to tell you whether he wants to drive, but he can certainly still drive. And I think he wants to do it. Whatever happened between Ron and Mika um, after that, whatever conversations there were, Mika drove. And the 96 year was... We were, we were evolving the car and, and evolving into our relationship with Mercedes-Benz. There were times in the year, uh, and this is a, an interesting story, forever we had um, used PSI, PSI, or pounds per square inch, as our tyre pressure reference. Um, a Mika appeared in, in 96 using bar, as the reference, which is the alternative way of doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it was like, where did that come from? And nobody knows. I, 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 we were just happy, to be honest, to see him driving. Uh, I remember because of the damage to his ears, um, Sid Watkins gave him a, um, a waiver to use the in-helmet speakers rather than the uh, earpieces, which, and that was a regulation that had, had come in in between the um, 95 and 96. By the time we got to 97, we had the old Mika back, but uh, uh, a new and improved version, I would say. And by the time we hit 98, he was the class of the field. He genuinely was the class of the field. I never really knew Michael. I spoke to him a couple of times, but nothing of any seriousness. But you just sensed through 98 and 99, and arguably 2000, that um, the only driver that genuinely had the legs of Michael was Mika. I think it was the Nürburgring race of... It was before we, we took off for Japan. It was end of 98, I think. Uh, Michael and the Ferrari were running good years and we were on Bridgestones. And we'd had a torrid practice at the Nürburgring in uh, 98. And we were obviously a serious contender for the championship. We were expected to win it because we'd done so well. Mm -hmm. And we just couldn't get the car to work in, in practice. Come the race, we didn't know it at the time, but we had got on top of it and Mika just took off in the race and just dominated it. And Michael was running second and um, he had such a lead. And I like total domination of a race. But any race engineer will, will say they like total domination. They don't, they don't like these races that go down to the wire. Mika backed off on the last lap and he backed off and I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? We knew the car was okay. We knew there was plenty of fuel. We had evolved following the accident in in uh, Adelaide. We'd evolved a much more streamlined method of radio communication with Mika because he he, he was con he used to concentrate so hard in the race that if I ever spoke to him during the race, which I had you have to from time to time, it would disrupt his concentration. And he, he would literally go slower, like maybe even half a second a lap slower, whilst you'd got this radio comms out of the way and he could carry on again. So, you know, we were, we were quiet on the pit wall and he comes around the final corner, thank God for that, and he rolls up to the line 
And Michael comes around the corner and sees him take the checkered flag. And I said to Mika, what the hell were you doing on that last lap? And he said, oh, I just wanted Michael to see me take the checkered flag. And, you know, you it, that was important to him to, in the psychological war that was going on uh, in the background towards winning, winning the championship. So we, we were on the grid at Suzuka and there was Michael and Mika on the front row of the grid. And basically this was going to be a race for the championship. And um, Mika was so chilled on that day, just so chilled. And I, I remember... Keki was there, and uh, I'd said to Keki earlier on Sunday, what sort of things have you been saying to him? And he said, I just told him to go and have fun, you know, because that's the, there's no instructions you can really give to a driver in that situation. You just want them to be focused on doing what they enjoy doing, which is driving racing cars and racing them. I, I was going out to the grid and you, you, there are a million things going through your mind as to what can go wrong because the cars were very complicated. They were still not the reliable entities that they are now. And um, so Mika was coming back from the grid. He always used to go to the toilet. And I was sort of working my way down pit wall on the, on the track side and there were people in the way and what have you. And someone had annoyed me and I don't get annoyed very often. And Mika saw this and he just said, calm, Steve, calm. And that, that coming from the driver to the engineer in that situation was, this bloke's not fussed about what's going on here. So um, I think we knew we knew he, he was in a good headspace, so to speak. Yeah. And the rest, the rest is history. I mean, the bloke was phenomenal. Uh, and it was... It, it wasn't just about racing the car uh, to the best of his ability. It was about beating Michael. He was very good at that. He was very, very good at that. And I think the, the incident at Spa a year or so later where, where he overtook him going into Lecon at the top of the hill, they um, uh, sandwiched Zonta. And I, I remember asking Ricardo Zonta, See, he was a test driver for us later on at McLaren. I said, what did you think when all that was going on? And he said, I wasn't looking. I just snuggled down in the cockpit when they came past me. I wasn't looking. I just didn't want to be there. But, you know, the the commitment Mika would show in that. And Michael had chopped him viciously the lap before. I know Martin, Martin Whitmarsh sent Ross Braun the front wing end plate, our front wing end plate with Michael's rubber over the front wing end plate. He said, he sent that to him after the race saying that was close and it was close, but yeah, he, he was a phenomenal competitor. He was. And that, I mean, that was such a thrilling moment. I mean, none of us will ever forget that. Well, we, it was, it was very Mika and very exciting. <laughs> There was Alonso and Hamilton at McLaren, of course. And Kimmy. Yes, and Raikkonen, yes. Um, you're certainly a damn sight easier to talk to than Kimmy. It wasn't a good atmosphere, was it? Or, 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 or was it hyped up by the media? Oh, with Fernando and Lewis. Yeah. How can I put this? It started really well. When, you, when, you, when you're living it for real, in other words, you don't know what's happened and you don't know what's going to happen. You have a very different approach to it when you look at it retrospectively and you know what did happen. And then you say, oh, well, you know, people should have seen that. Well, we didn't. The pace of Lewis very, very pleasantly surprised us all. I mean, he'd come from, I don't know what they called it then, GP2 or Formula 3000 or whatever it was. He, he'd stepped up from that. He'd won the championship. Lewis's early career evolution in, into Formula One was pretty well storybook. I think the only the only category he hung for two years in was Formula Renault. Uh, and then it was move up, win it, move up, win it, move up, and so on, so on. For a driver to do that against the opposition that he had, there was there was only one outcome, and that was Formula One. And Ron managed that and got him and got him in the car, we get to Melbourne and Lewis is quick. And Lewis 
had for its day a preparation program for Formula One that was way ahead of its time in terms of we had the tools at McLaren to prepare him probably like no other driver had been prepared at, at that time. So he arrives in Melbourne, uh, obviously never been there before, done a lot of work on the simulator, and he's quick. Fernando is quick. So we've got two quick drivers up there. Kimi is also quick in the Ferrari. We get to the race and we, we finish with both drivers on the podium. Mark Slade, who was running Fernando, and I was head of race engineering, but I was, I was actually managing Fernando on track. I think, oh, blimey, this is going to be a tussle this year because Lewis is clearly quick. We'll see how we do when we get to Malaysia. Fernando wins Malaysia. Uh, Lewis is still quick. And we're going, this is going to be an interesting year. We get to Monaco and we have the drivers running one, two, Fernando leading um, Lewis second. We get after the, the final pit stop. And the deal was everybody turns the engines down. Everybody just goes to the end. That's the finishing order. All the common sense rules of motor racing kick in. So I, I say to Fernando over the radio, okay, um, go to what yellow, whatever it was, the, the sort of wind the power down setting because we were having to look after the engines because we were on limited power units and all of this. So there was a lot of damage control. So he turns the engine down. And Lewis comes right up to the back of him. So Fernando turns the engine up and um, and sort of gaps him a little bit. And uh, I said, hey, Fernando, we need to turn the engine down. He said, I'll turn mine down when he turns his down. And, and Ron is telling Lewis's team to turn the engine down. And I think Ron actually may even even got on the radio himself. Anyway, we get it all settled down. You know, we don't want any shenanigans, heroics or anything. We want a one-two at Monaco. We get it. And then Lewis says in the in the press conference, words to the effect that um, I can't remember what the exact question was that was asked of Lewis. Like, um, how do you feel for finishing second at Monaco at your first attempt? And he, he goes all glum and says, well, that's why I've got number two on my car or whatever. And I thought, uh-oh, this is not how you should be behaving. And there you go. It's a real shame, that sort of stuff. It is, because it's it's something above and beyond competitive. They both had very quick cars. It was a good car that year. It was a shame. Can you can you throw any light for us? Because right now everybody's talking about Fernando Alonso for obvious reasons. Can you throw any light on what it is about the man that he's very slightly different in some ways from your average Formula One driver. He has a sort of signature, the way he puts the car into a corner. Can you throw any light on on having worked with him at McLaren, the way he operates, maybe with, with an engineer? or, or... So obviously I had one year with um, Fernando, which was 2007, and that is, what, 16 years ago now. I only see nowadays the, the public side of Fernando. We're still seeing the fundamental uh, speed and desire uh, of Fernando to, to race. Some, some drivers, want, when they achieve certain goals, the backside of that achievement is, if you have done that, and there is a sort of relaxation and a little bit of a cruise mode, that, that's never happened with Fernando. And there is I don't think it's ever happened with Lewis either, to be honest. There are a number of great drivers. Uh, Michael, it never happened to Michael. Just let me drive, let me race, let me compete. That cluster of drivers, they just want to keep going and going and going. I don't know what is in Fernando's long-term plan 
but certainly looking at his performances in the car this year in that Aston Martin, I'm seeing the same desire that I was seeing in 2007 from Fernando to to win. And I think the two championships that Fernando won before he joined McLaren are not enough for him. Will he ever win another one? I don't know, but he's giving it his best shot. Uh, and so fundamentally, I don't think he's changed. Does, does he like a car set up in a very particular way? The, the way the way the cars are now, that they operate in a very fine, tiny window. And the quality of the drivers that drive them, there is, it probably it was starting back in, <clears throat> in the noughties, if you like, the tyre management and the focus on optimising the tyre. And I think that has gone with the evolution of the tyres now, uh, gone to even more extreme limits. So I think the driver is more adapting to how the tyre need how the tyre needs to behave to get the grip out of it to get, to get the uh, performance out of the car. So the driver w- is the adapting mechanism rather than adapting the car to the driver. And I think it's whatever you have to do as a driver and engineer to optimize your tire operating window around the car. That is what drives the the balance of the car rather than the driver saying, oh, I prefer a a car that I can trail brake to the set set apex and have it rotate on me and this, that, and the other. It's about the tires. Even in our GT racing, that we, we we do with the Lexus program, um, there is a big emphasis with our drivers on t- tire management and tire optimization. And, you know, we're looking at the internal carcass temperatures of the tires on the front axle and the rear axle or on all four tires. And we're, we're trying to help the driver manage his tires because endurance racing is about... Uh, your stint performance and and you know when you when you hear you hear people say oh the the driver burned the tires off the, the rear tires off the car fundamentally that's what he can do if he's not careful and we we have tools now to help us help the driver keep the tires in that window and it's whatever we have to do to the car to to do that is what matters most. That's really interesting. I must say, I've never I've never heard um, about that before. It's int- I mean, we hear constantly, constantly about tyres. That's very interesting. Before we go there, I just want to ask you a question about the Goodwood Festival of Speed because I happen to know that um, a lot of people who read Motorsport magazine and listen to our podcast also go to Goodwood. I was very close to this at the time, but I've always wanted to know, what did you do to the car? And what did you tell Nick Heidfeld before you set the course record at the Goodwood Festival of Speed in 1999 with the McLaren Mercedes? So that was an interesting weekend. Um, because no, normally the uh, the good Goodwood affair um, is uh, relatively relaxing. It, obviously, you don't want anything to go wrong with the car or embarrass the company or anything like that. In in those days, it, it, we were sort of still being competitive, and I use the term a little bit loosely. You know, it wasn't. It absolutely wasn't overly serious, but. If if we were going to compete, you know, neither Ron or Martin were happy with the second place. So um, so we we get to Goodwood that particular year, and um, we do two runs on the Friday. I think we did. I can't remember. It was one or two runs on the Friday. And Nick Nick gets out of the car. Says, "Oh, I don't know about this car. There's something wrong with this car." And I'm thinking. Oh, that's the last thing we need to hear. <laughs> Goodwood. So um, Dermot Walsh uh, was was with me um, looking after the car because the car had come out of. Mm. Uh, we we'd used the um, former three thousand team boys to to help us um, run the car that year. 
I said, well, what, what's the car doing? He said, well, it's just nervous. You know, I can't get the power down. I mean, it's like not nice to drive. So I thought, bloody hell. Oh, we, we were quick, but we weren't like, it wasn't comfortable. And I didn't want Nick to overdo it. And as and it, the whole thing ended in tears. So we, um, we did a set down on the car. The car had way too much toe out on the front and way too much toe in on the rear. And the guy, the guy that had set it based on the setup sheet, we'd effectively got twice as much toe on the front that we need toe out on the front that we needed, and twice as much toe in on the rear that we needed. And it was a misinterpretation from the uh, Formula One setup sheet to the um, three thousand crew setup sheet. So we re- we reset the toes. We go back for Saturday. And I think the weather was messy on Saturday. So we we didn't really get a clear read. The guy that was driving the Tyrrell, he was a historic racer. It was Martin Stratton. And I, I think he sensed an opportunity. And um, we we got through Saturday. Um, we thought everything was okay, but we, we weren't really sure because of the conditions. We, we turn up at Goodwood Sunday morning and Nick said to me, that Martin Stratton, do you know him? I said, well, I know who he is, but I don't know him. He said, well, he was on my table last night at the party, and he was just giving me what for. And Nick is Nick is a very polite, um, well-spoken German guy, and he was he was very young at the time. He was a 3,000 driver and a test driver for the Formula 1 team. I really want to make sure I beat him. I said, okay. So we, we, we went um, down for our first run on Sunday and the conditions were, were a bit better. And I think we were, we were okay Sunday morning. And then we came to the final run and it was dry and, you know, all sorts of people were popping out the woodwork to, to, to see this. I, I stood at the start line with the radium and Nick, I think, was like the last driver up or something like that. It was very staged very well there. And I pulled the um, uh, headset off one ear so I could hear the engine. And I, all I wanted to hear, first of all, was the engine going all the way to the top of the hill and, and not, not coming to uh, a standstill, <laughs> an unfortunate standstill somewhere else on the hill. And then uh, uh, he did that. And then the time came over, which I still remember today. I think it was 41.6 seconds. And it was like, oh, my God, because you cannot take a shortcut at, um, at Goodwood. And um, Nick, Nick achieved what he told me he wanted to do, make sure it put the time way, way, way out of Martin Stratton's reach. <laughs> and that was it. Um, I'm- I, I just finished that story. I, I, I went back. Monday morning, uh, Martin Martin was actually at the at Goodwood for for the Sunday, and I went to see him on on uh, the Monday, and I said, I think Martin, we we should really just do demonstration runs now because that when you look at the onboard and you look how fast that was, and what what we're actually doing. I think we should just do demonstration runs now. And I think pretty well all, all the Formula One teams were were pretty happy just to do that because it was uh, very quick. And, uh, and I, I recently looked at the car that, uh, that beat the record. I think the record stood for best part of 20 years, maybe. And I saw the, um, the fan car. Uh, the Mercury, yeah. Yeah, my God. That was quick. Well, look, I'm glad I asked you about that because um, people still talk about it. That's 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 why. And um, the video is still exhilarating. Oh, it is. It is. Nick was very, very happy with that, his performance then. So was I. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Steve. It's been absolutely fascinating. So I, all I can do is say thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day. And a big thanks to Scalextric for supporting these Motorsport Engineering the Greats podcasts. And um, bye-bye. Thank you very much, Steve. Cheers, Rob. Really good to catch up with you. Bye.
Experience the thrill of the race with Scale Electric, proud sponsors of the Motorsport Podcast.